Just like it's super important to start the semester with a discussion about weight stigma, it's also really important to start the semester with a conversation about complexity and systems thinking, something that we've talked about in BPK 340, and that's really essential to the study of obesity. Unfortunately, typically when we talk about obesity or any kind of weight-related matters, we typically use something called reductionist thinking, which is not systems thinking. So, for instance, a, a sentence that would be considered reductionist in nature is obesity is simple. People don't exercise enough and they eat too much. Also, often when we give advice to people that are dealing with weight related issues, we often use reductionist thinking as advice too. So we might say just eat less, just exercise more. And one of the problems with this line of thinking is that it doesn't really address the fact that obesity is complex. It, the causes of obesity are complex, they're interrelated, they change over time, they're different for everyone, um, they're sometimes random in nature, and just reducing obesity to people don't exercise enough and they eat too much, it really just kind of dismisses the complexity of this issue and it has failed <laughs> to make a difference in actually managing the disease as well, okay? So reductionist thinking is this thought process that complex systems can be explained by reducing them to a small number of simpler variables. And I understand why people often want to reduce things because it makes it easier to study. So if we say things like obesity is just due to a lack of exercise and overeating, that's easier to understand than really looking at all the genetic to environmental factors that promote obesity. So this type of reductionist thinking uh, looks at the components of a system instead of the system as a whole. Okay, so when things are complex, and we'll define that term a little bit more in a bit, we don't want to just look at the various parts of the system. We also want to look at what the whole thing is doing as well. That's more of a systems thinking view. So, like I mentioned, there's many problems with using a reductionist lens to study obesity. And one of these things is that it doesn't account for the interrelation and feedback amongst variables. So we might just uh, dismiss obesity uh, for a certain person and say, well, they binge eat too much. Okay, yes, binge eating can promote obesity, but why is someone binge eating so much? Perhaps they're binge eating a lot because they are currently dealing with depression. And perhaps they're currently dealing with depression because of their weight or because of something else that's going on with them personally or an environmental influence as well. So we often just look at one variable, one component, without understanding the feedback between components as well. Okay. Also, oversimplification fails to acknowledge that there's often various causes, various risk factors, various interrelated factors that promote obesity. And often the solutions we look at are just, again, simplistic in nature, like telling people to eat less and exercise more. Also, a big issue with reductionist thinking is that we kind of label everyone the same. We think that everyone's, you know, uh, potential weight is due to the same types of factors when in fact everyone who has obesity has kind of their own map have their own system of reasons of why they are at that size yes it boils down to how much we eat and how much we exercise but what are the things that are are causing that what are the things that are influencing how much we eat what are the things that are influencing our, our physical activity patterns and for each person it's going to be at least slightly different but when we simplify, we don't account for the differences between human beings. And then we approach, we have a, like a one size fits all approach. And also when we're looking at obesity through a reductionist or simplistic lens, it's harder to predict what's actually gonna happen when we apply a particular intervention. And we don't really account for like random things that can happen that can also shift the system. A really good example of this is COVID, is the pandemic that happened, that's happening, that has really shifted the system, the weight system of Canada and a lot of the world as well, where there's even more factors that are promoting promoting obesity these days and a lot of people have gained weight over COVID and if we just again look at it like we'll just eat less and exercise more we're not really accounting for all the complex things that are going on due to something random that we weren't expecting that are promoting obesity. 
Okay, so to kind of really hammer in this concept of reductionism, here is an example of reductionism. This is a duck, <laughs> and we could look at a duck by, you know, bringing that duck down to all of its little machinery <laughs> and looking at the different parts of that duck, and obviously this is, this is not truly what a duck looks like inside, but we don't consider the whole. We just look at it as the, the kind of the sum of its parts. And an even better example of this is our study of the brain. And you know, I teach anatomy sometimes, and I love studying the brain, but I get frustrated studying the brain because often we're like, okay, this lobe does this, that lobe does that, this other area does this, this region does that, and that's just not how the brain works. It's not like Wernicke's is working in isolation. It's not like our frontal lobe is working in isolation. There's lots of communication between different parts of the brain. And we know that even if we remove parts of the brain, there's other parts of the brain that can make up for it because it's a system, okay? And we can't study the brain fully and fully understand, and that's why it's so hard to study the brain by just looking at what one region does or what another region does, okay? Because there's so much interrelation and feedback and it changes over time and there's sometimes random things that happen in the brain that are hard to account for, you know, the brain is such a good example of some, of a complex system <laughs> that's actually working within another complex system, which is our whole organism, right? Our bodies are complex systems and all the different parts of the body, you know, if you take out the brain, you can't understand the body just by looking at the brain. You can't understand the body by just looking at the heart or the liver or the kidneys, etc. Okay, and even if we know what all of those do, we still can't fully understand the body because we have to really look at the relationship between the different parts of the body to understand how the system is operating as a whole. Which of course makes it challenging and that's why it's difficult to really fully understand the body and we're always learning. Okay, so system science looks beyond this reductionist thinking. And a system, to define the term, is an interconnected set of elements. So this would be an element according to this little model right here, but these are the interconnections, okay? So it's an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized. It like self-organizes in a particular way that leads to kind of something bigger overall or something emerges from there. And we'll talk about emergence in a while, okay? System thinking focus more bet uh, on the connections, like I keep saying, between components than the components itself. Okay, so instead of just looking at the frontal lobe of the brain, or they'll say the prefrontal cortex of the brain, we would actually look at what's communicating with the prefrontal cortex and what the prefrontal cortex is communicating with as well and all the messages that are coming in and how that's all being integrated. That's more of a systems science kind of lens, okay? But again, and again, I'll use the brain as an example, even if I look at all the different parts of that system, you know, just knowing what each of those individual parts does, it doesn't help me understand what the larger system does. Okay, so again, with the brain, just knowing what each part does doesn't actually begin to explain what our amazing brains are capable of. Okay, so again, if you've taken 340 recently, there is a lot more com complex system science in there. Um, and in fact, you would have listened to a discussion by um, a Diane Feingood, who uh, is a member of BPK and who specializes in complex systems. And one of the things we did in 340 is we differentiated between simple systems and complex ones and that's what you're reading this week is going to do as well is it's going to give a little bit more detail on what we mean by complex systems specifically related to obesity okay so simple or, com or complicated systems complicated systems are more complicated than simple ones but they're still easier to figure out and less about kind of those higher level connections and more feedback and all those kind of things. So simpler complicated systems, they're more homogenous, they're linear, we can kind of figure them out easily, they don't change much over time, they're, they kind of function independently, there's no feedback. Whereas a complex system, we're more likely to see things like feedback or interdependency. So feedback would be like one thing leading to something else, leading to something else and feeding back into the system. So kind of hard to explain it like that, but think of like 
feedback with temperature regulation, which you probably have learned about, or even feedback with hormone secretion in the body. Okay, the way we secrete hormones in the body is, is based on a feedback system which monitors levels in the body and we release hormones due to the particular needs, but there's a feedback system in place there. Interdependency, that's where like one thing is, is kind of linked to something else, they're interdependent and they rely on each other. Uh, dynamics, this means that something changes over time. So for instance, our obesogenic environment has changed a lot over time. If you look at the factors that promoted obesity in the 60s, they were very different than the ones that promote obesity today. There's a lot more of them today. Oopsie. Heterogeneity, I already spoke to this, that everyone is a bit different and they're going to respond to interventions differently. I think you know this. You have two people on the exact same uh, fitness training regimen and their bodies are going to adapt in a different way. Okay, And nonlinearity, it changes over time. So another good example with like uh, interventions is you'll notice that people that are on a weight loss diet, caloric restriction, they don't typically lose weight like this. You know, there's typically a non-linear response. It might go down and then it might flatten out. You know, that's an example of non-linearity of this system. Okay, so here's an example of a complex systems map. I do not expect you to memorize this. This is more for you guys to understand what a system looks like and a complex system looks like if we use a particular frame. Okay, so this is a larger frame to uh, map out the fishery system in the United States. But again, I'm not going to really go through this. Here's an example of a system map looking specifically at appetite regulation. And we're going to come back to this system map as well. So in this map, what some of the things we'll notice is we do see some interdependency here. Two-way arrows denote interdependency. Uh, this one's not that great at showing feedback or the complexity of the feedback. Usually when we see feedback, it looks something like this. But this is it's not the best <laughs> view of the complexity of appetite regulation, but it does give a little bit more um, view of what a complex system looks like as opposed to a very more simple, simplistic, reductionist view of appetite, where we would just look at appetite as, okay, the stomach talks to the appetite center, the pancreas talks to the appetite center, adipose tissue talks to the appetite center, and we don't realize that actually things go both ways. Okay, so the appetite center also is able to communicate out as well, and it does things that affect other parts of the body as well. There's a system, there's an interrelationship. It's not one way, everything feeding into one area. There's a lot of two-way arrows, there's a lot of feedback arrows, there's things that change over time. Appetite regulation is very much a complex system, but often we simplify it. That said, we sometimes need to simplify things to understand them better. However, we can't always use a simplistic view of things because we're really going to miss out on how to properly intervene or do something about a system that's more complex. So all of this discussion was kind of bringing us more towards this map, which if you've taken BPK 340, if you've taken BPK 110 with me, you have seen this map before. And this is what we call the obesity systems map that came out of the Foresight Group in the UK in 2007. And basically what this map was, was a lot of different stakeholders in obesity came together and they're like, all right, let's figure out everything <laughs> that causes obesity that we have an evidence base for. And let's not only look at all these factors that cause obesity, but let's talk about how they relate to each other. You know, how does one thing lead to something else and what else is kind of part of that system? Okay. So this map that, like I said, came out in 2007 was a big game changer in obesity because it, its main goal was to shift our view away from this reductionist view of obesity into understanding that there are so many different causes of obesity. Each of these little boxes is a different evidence-based cause of obesity. And there's so many of these elements and they interact with each other in different ways to overall promote there's an emergence to this system, and in this current system, the emergence is obesity right now. And the emergence is certain, let's say, mental models around obesity as well, which is kind of keeping us stuck <laughs> in, our, in, our, in our way of thinking. 
Okay, so the goal of the OBC system map was to determine the sum of all the relevant factors and their interdependencies that determine the condition of obesity for an individual or a group of people. So this is the obesity systems map, and if I were to zoom into it, I would see all the different interdependencies between different elements of the system, ultimately driving energy balance. Okay, and you can't really see it because I've use a different model here but over here this is kind of environmental factors that promote physical activity here are individual factors that promote physical activity individual factors that promote uh, that affect our psychology social factors that affect our psychology food production um, food consumption and our physiology and you'll notice that there's a lot of interrelation between these different groups you'll also notice that feedback exists on this map too so we see a feedback loop right here where you'll see a, 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 an arrow going from demand for convenience to convenience of food offerings to de-skilling and back to demand for convenience. That's a feedback loop. And let me explain this feedback loop so we, we understand it a little bit more. So in this example, our um, demand for convenience, so people's demand for convenience food, causes the food industry to offer us more convenience foods, right? If there's a demand for it, well, the food industry is like happy to oblige <laughs> and happy to give us lots of fast food and like um, convenience foods that, you know, we, we buy. And because we buy these convenience foods, that leads to de-skilling. Can you figure out what de-skilling means? Well, de-skilling means that because we're buying convenience foods, we don't really need to know how to prepare our own foods. We don't really need to know how to cook, right? 30 years ago, if no one in your family knew how to cook, you're probably not eating. Nowadays, if no one in your household knows how to cook, no problem. Okay, but if we don't know how to cook, we don't know how to prepare our own foods, then we're going to keep it demanding for convenience. And this is an example of a feedback loop that reinforces itself. So using a complex system lens, we're not just going to look at how people don't know how to cook or how there's a lot of convenience foods out there or how we demand for convenience. We're going to look at which part of this system is the easiest to influence and is going to make the biggest difference. And then perhaps we're going to kind of intervene in that area, knowing that one of those elements affects other elements as well. Okay, so we're going to exam examine the obesity systems map a little bit more in class, but I just wanted to give you that view of it. To kind of bring together this obesity system map, I just want to tell you a little bit more about it, uh, read you a couple quotes. Uh, by communicating the systematic and messy nature of the problem, this system map can help to refocus the discussion away from ineffective single intervention approaches so all the approaches so far have been really simplistic, kind of single, looking at one single factor, and instead fo refocus the discussion towards solutions more appropriate for complex systems. And we'll talk about that in a future uh, module, okay? So again, this common complex systems view focuses more on a whole system approach. So instead of just looking at obesity as like people that eat too much and they don't exercise enough, we look at all the different factors that are promoting that with an environment and how they interact with each other. And then looking at that, we can then say, okay, which levers are going to make the most influence if we pull them? Which areas are going to affect a lot of different areas? And can we make a difference in one area to make a difference in a lot of other ones? And kind of one of the biggest areas that we can make a difference in is our mental models around obesity and weight as well. But those are sometimes really hard to do. Okay. But again, really important discussion to start off the semester is to refocus our understanding of obesity away from a simplistic reductionist view of it. People eat too much and they don't exercise enough to a complex systems view of it, where we realize that a number of, of interrelated factors that change over time, that are sometimes random, that are different for everyone, work together to promote obesity on a, on a population level, but also promote a, obesity on an individual level as well, okay? So the rest of the semester is gonna be framed with that understanding, and that's why it was so important to talk about it first.